Buongiorno a tutti, eh, pensavo di cominciare anche perché siamo qua con Marc Tarabella che deve andare via e quindi ci eh, saluta velocemente. E, per chi non parla italiano c'è la traduzione nelle cuffie. In, in, um, come si dice? Cuffie. Earphones. Yes, you can put uh, uh, and uh, there is uh, the translation. And um, siamo, siamo qui un, uh, con Mark Tarabella che ci vuole salutare. Uh, Mark Tarabella aveva proposto la candidatura di uh, Julian Assange per il gruppo SD, però sono state fatte altre scelte e che, però lui sostiene insomma questa candidatura e uh, voleva salutarci. Grazie Mark. Grazie Sabrina. Uh, sì, volevo brevemente perché devo scappare, però con, vi congratulo per la, questa iniziativa, uh, tutti i colleghi, Claire Dali, Cincic e Sabrina, perché uh, lo merita, uh, Giulia, uh, Julian Assange è questo, come si dice, lanciatore d'allerta, whistleblowers, uh, sono utili, più che utili alla democrazia. And I think that's, yes, indeed. Uh, as Edward Snowden also, and they are very useful to democracy because I, where, where, where I was just outside, I read freedom at press, uh, freedom of press is at risk. It means that also democracy is at risk, and I think that uh, we have to fight, and as you mentioned, Sabrina, very uh, briefly, just before coming, why does Europe doesn't react about that? And I think that uh, what lives uh, Mrs. Assange, uh, we are honored to be close to you. Uh, what, do you what is living uh, Julian for a few, couple of years now in the embassy of Ecuador in London, etc. Uh, maybe, and uh, I think that uh, we have to support you, you, your children, your family. And I hope that it will not be a threat to, to the United States because uh, it would be a great mistake for democracy in Europe. We give lesson to the rest of the world at the European level and we are not able to to act for a, a citizen who is acting for democracy. Thank you for your invitation. Unfortunately, I have to leave, but full support for your initiative. Oggi eh, abbiamo deciso di organizzare questa iniziativa perché, come sapete, come sapete abbiamo candidato Giuliana Assange per il premio Sakharov. Sappiamo che sarà molto difficile che possa raggiungere, che possa vincere, è un anno particolare, questo lo sapete tutti quanti, però credo che sia un segno politico, un'iniziativa un prima di tutto politica per cercare di... Eh, Alzare l'attenzione su questo caso perché non è possibile che le istituzioni europee non prendano posizione su Julian Assange. Assange è stato in queste aule, è stato ospite del Parlamento europeo e adesso non si capisce perché quando prima andava bene e adesso non va più bene. Oggi sono esattamente tre anni e mezzo che eh, Assange è chiuso in una prigione. E è chiuso in una prigione senza un processo, è chiuso in una prigione dove eh, non può avere eh, contatti frequenti con i propri figli, non può vedere crescere i propri figli. Ma oggi non siamo qui solo per Assange, oggi siamo qui per la libertà di stampa e di espressione e per la difesa dei diritti umani che dovrebbero essere il fondamento proprio del premio Sakharov. E siamo qui perché... Eh, Assange riguarda tutti noi, tutti quanti noi che vogliamo sapere la verità sulle cose. E noi sappiamo quello che è successo nella guerra in Iraq, nella guerra in Afghanistan, solo grazie ad Assange. E se lui ha fatto qualcosa per noi, ha fatto qualcosa di importante per noi, ci ha dato il diritto di sapere la verità, ora tocca a noi. Ora tocca a noi fare qualcosa per lui, a tutti quanti noi. Dobbiamo cominciare a mobilitarci come società civile, come istituzioni per Assange, perché non è possibile che si denunciano i regimi e eh, la privazione della stampa, della libertà di stampa solo in alcuni casi. La libertà di stampa vale sempre e dovrebbe valere soprattutto in quegli stati che si dicono democratici. 
Con questo voglio ringraziare tutti quanti i colleghi che hanno firmato per presentare questa, questa candidatura. Oltre a quelli al tavolo qui con me eh, c'è Pedicini che ha, eh, qua in sala e ha firmato pure lui, eh, ci sono i colleghi della mia delegazione che ringrazio e adesso lascio la parola, non voglio andare troppo oltre, lascio la parola ai colleghi e poi alla fine ci saranno anche delle domande se volete insomma perché sono molto contenta e ringrazio molto Stella di essere qui oggi e credo che sia importante la sua presenza perché eh, ci può dare la testimonianza diretta di quello che eh, è combattere per la libertà di stampa perché Stella sta facendo una, una grossa battaglia una grossa battaglia come madre, una grossa battaglia come donna e una grossa battaglia come cittadina soprattutto. Grazie. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Pignadoli and all the MEPs who have supported Julian's candidacy for the Sakharov Prize. Uh, it was incredibly... Um, encouraging to him that this year uh, so many MPs had gotten together and I know that many MEPs had wanted to support the prize as well um, but couldn't um, because Julian's uh, his life is really at risk and I'm not exaggerating Julian has been in the harshest prison in the United Kingdom. They call it Britain's Guantanamo, Belmarsh Prison, for three and a half years, over three and a half years. And it's extremely grim in there. And just a couple of days ago, Julian was tested positive for COVID. And that means that he's been placed in isolation, in further isolation. He spent three and a half years in, uh, in very difficult conditions in there. Uh, but when they put you in isolation, in lockdown, it means you're in, in a cell for 24 hours a day and you don't leave the cell. You don't leave for a shower, you don't leave for food, you don't leave for medication. And um, so he's been in, in that cell for since uh, Saturday for about 72 hours now. Imagine that. And we don't know how long that will last. But that's just, um, it's a drop in the ocean of the brutality and cruelty that is being meted on Julian every day. The very existence of this, uh, of this case prolongs his suffering and he's suffering profoundly. I just want to give you two anecdotes to show you kind of a little snapshots of what's going on. The first is what happened on Saturday in London, and I don't know if you're aware, but we managed to get the most massive showing of support for Julian to date. And we actually set ourselves quite an ambitious goal which was to surround the British Parliament. And I don't know if you've been to London, but you may know that the British Parliament on one side faces the River Thames. And to surround Parliament, that meant we had to surround Parliament on one side of, of the river. And then we had to cross two bridges and also surround and uh, cross the other side of the Thames. And we calculated we'd need about 5,000 people to do that. And on Saturday, um, there was also a transport strike. So a lot of people said, well, this, this cannot possibly, uh, they cannot possibly achieve this with a transport strike. And lots of people were skeptical to begin with. And when you saw the anonymous trolls on Twitter, they would say, don't show up, no one will show up. Well, we far exceeded 5,000 people. And there's uh, footage 
to show it. The footage speaks for itself. We surrounded both sides of the Thames and both bridges. And in places, there were the, the uh, sidewalk was replete with people. There were easily 7,000 people. There could have been 10 or 12,000 people in the heart of London. Don't let anyone say that Julian doesn't have support. Just look at those images. And that is because the average citizen understands that what has been happening here, they have come to realize, is a brutal and primitive political persecution of an inv individual, a brutal persecution by a state, a cynical abuse of the law in order to keep a man imprisoned out of a punitive um, urge that started under, under the Trump administration. The charges came under the Trump administration in 2018. And why did they come under the Trump administration? Because the Trump administration knew that this case would set a precedent that would allow the US government to go after the press, to use the Espionage Act for uh, publishing, for receiving information from a source, for possessing that information, and for making it public. The use of the Espionage Act does not mean that the US is accusing Julian of being a spy. There is no allegation of that. The Espionage Act is very broadly worded. It was introduced in 1917, in the, minute, in the middle of the First World War, and it was worded, worded broadly so that it could be repurposed. And it was immediately used against dissidents who opposed the US participation in, in the uh, First World War. And then for the first time ever under the Trump administration, that piece of legislation was repurposed to be used against a publisher. And if you look at the breakdown of the charges against Julian, he faces 170 years in order to, uh, in relation to receiving information from a source. I'm repeating it, but just think of the process. Possessing information and making it and communicating it. The, the act of communicating is a crime. This is at odds with the very fundamental uh, principles of freedom of speech and of press freedom. You cannot marry these two concepts. What is being done against Julian is an attack not only on the press, but on the ability to communicate freely and to speak the truth, and for that truth to be disseminated. I'm gonna give you another uh, little snapshot of what's going on. So the other day, I have two children with Julian, um, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And so the other day, uh, my three-year-old was playing in the, in the living room um, with a friend of mine who was visiting, and I kind of saw from the corner of my eye uh, that, that they were playing something and I didn't understand, my friend didn't really understand what was going on. And I realized what, what my three-year-old was doing. My three-year-old was playing at being the security guard in Belmarsh prison. He was doing the, the, the wand, you know, the magnetic wand when they do um, front and back. And so I'll describe to you what my children have to go to in order, through in order to see their father. So we have to go through an airlock, which means doors that close. Um, so you go through a little into a little compartment. One door closes. They take your fingerprints. They don't take the three-year-old's fingerprints. They take mine. Okay. We go through the airlock. One door closes. The other one opens. After they take my fingerprints, I go through. Then we go through airport-style security, like you have here in the European Parliament. <clears throat> and um, then you go through a, a, a metal detector arch. Then you go through the wand. They go from head to toe. You have to lift your, your feet. You take your shoes off, obviously. You can't carry anything in. Not a paper, not a tissue. The children have to go through that, too. They do the wand from head to toe, front and back, under their feet. Then we go through a second um, body search. They pat you down. They look behind your ears. They look in your hair. You open your mouth. They look under your tongue. 
they pat you down front and back. Under your feet, they put your, their hands under your feet, your bare feet. And then you go through another airlock. And then another airlock. And then there's a dog search. And the dog searches you. Toe to, it jumps up on you, it smells you, goes back, you have to stay still, the children have to stay still. And it's quite intimidating, a dog search. And they have to do this just to see their father once a week. Think about that. And why? What has Julian done? He published the truth about war crimes against a powerful government that is exerting its power to punish him. This cruelty, this cruelty is against Julian. It's also against us as a family, against my children, but also against all of you. And staying quiet is just being complicit in this atrocity. And I commend every MEP who supported this nomination because what, that's what it takes. You have to raise the political... Um, uh, the, the um, profile, the political profile of this case until it is absolutely impossible for the UK to extradite and for the US to prosecute. You all know what a political case is. You all know what it takes. This is a pure political persecution happening in the heart of Europe. Well, but the consequences of this case will affect all of us. And I'll tell you why because Julian will try to fight this all the way, all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. And what is decided in the European Court of Human Rights in relation to Julian's case will set the scope of press freedom in the whole Council of Europe uh, area. That includes all the European countries. This is not just about Julian upsetting the US. This is not just about the UK and the US. This is a European issue. And it's also a European issue because what WikiLeaks revealed was also um, attacks on European sovereignty, on European citizens. Khalid al Masri, a German citizen who was abducted and taken to Egypt and tortured um, sorry, it was taken to black sites and tortured by the CIA. It was a case of mistaken identity. When they realized that, they dumped him in Macedonia. And then Germany found out. They found out the US, the CIA had been torturing its citizen and that it was a case of mistaken identity and they knew who the perpetrators were. And then the US embassy intervened politically to stop any extradition, any, any real um, accountability for the people who had tortured the, the German citizen. We're talking about torture. We're talking about killings. We're talking about the subversion of judicial processes within Europe that we all owe Julian for having revealed, for having taken the, a, a brave position to actually hold governments to account. And WikiLeaks, Julian's idea with WikiLeaks, which he implemented, was to actually, um, it grew out of the idea in the early 2000s, in the first decade of the 2000s, of government transparency and accountability. That is what WikiLeaks grew out of. Do we talk about transparency and government accountability anymore? I don't see it mentioned much. And that is the trajectory we're on. Because Julian is in prison and he's been in a high security prison for three and a half years. And before that he was uh, persecuted and they, were, they used uh, abused legal processes in order to keep him in a legal limbo where he could not defend himself and he was silenced. The trajectory of this case is clear. They have tried to attack Julian's reputation. 
They have tried to cast doubt over his motivations. They have tried to tarnish WikiLeaks' reputation as well. But it won't work, and I'll tell you why. Because the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, who was a skeptic, who was approached in 2019 or 2018 and said, I'm not going to look at that case because I don't, I'm not interested in, in, in Assange and WikiLeaks and what's going on. And then he was approached a second time. And then he said, well, actually, I have a duty to at least read the file. And he read the file. And then he realized he just had to scratch the surface. And what, what transpired was the most, the greatest travesty of justice in the West of our times. This case is the case of our generation. It defines where we're at right now and where we're going. What happens to Julian happens to all of us because it, because it is our right to know that is being attacked. It is the right to speak the truth and so the special rapporteur on torture, Niels Meltzer, he wrote a whole book about it. And he said, I was propagandized. I had received all these ideas and all I had to do was investigate. And so I wrote a book after investigating because everyone has to know this. And it's not just Niels Meltzer. There are films being made. And five years from now, everyone will say, well, of course, I was fighting for Assange. Prove it. Do it now. Save his life. His life depends on people sitting in this room. If you're in this room, you can do something. Help me save his life. Myself and Patrick are deciding who has the hard job of following that. If we were strategic, we would have placed Stella last. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, that was powerful testimony. And I'd just like to maybe start by thanking Sabrina in particular and Cinque Stella for uh, spearheading this event, which is one of a number of events around the case of Julian. This one centred on the Sakharov Prize. And it's so good to see so many representatives from the political groups. It is really very important and all are very welcome. I want to start by making the point that 12 years ago in June of 2010, Julian was in the same building as we are now. And he was here to speak about his work on WikiLeaks and the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative at a conference hosted by ALDI, which is now the Renew Group in the European Parliament. And during the time when he was here, as part of his speech, he observed that he had walked past the Sakharov Prize dedicated and named after Andrei Sakharov. Now, Sakharov was, of course, a nuclear physicist who was instrumental in the Soviet Union achieving thermonuclear um, weapons. And much like his counterpart, Robert Oppenheimer in the US, he was profoundly changed by the moral and political gravity of his inventions and the desperate implications of nuclear war and became absolutely convinced of the need for peace and dedicated the rest of his life to peace activism. That made him a dissident in the Soviet Union, resulting in his persecution. And the European Parliament every year gives a prize in his name for freedom of thought. And I just want to read out some of the remarks that Assange made 12 years ago in a meeting room very much like this one. And he pointed out that Sakharov and many others are the victims of what he called totalitarian in Russia. But he said, it's not just Russia. And he went on to say, and it's quite prophetic and scary when you hear these words now, 12 years on, he said, we should understand that where Andrei Sakharov came from in an ideological sense and why he is there. Of course, the man was a genuine hero. However, during the Cold War, there was an uneasy alliance between liberals and war hawks, between liberals trying to keep the best values of the European Enlightenment, between the press who wanted liberation for their own domestic affairs, and between those who wanted a moral stick to beat the Soviet Union. He said that produced in an ideological and political sense the poster of Andrei Sakharov in this very building. 
He went on to say, that uneasy alliance is now gone. This is 12 years ago. The alliance between liberals and conservatives to push freedom of expression is gone. And that's why all around the world in different ways, it's being wound back because authoritarianism, whether it's institutional or whether it's state based, is not a friend of freedom of expression. It's inherently opposed to it. And so now we have a fight on our hands. And he was absolutely right. We had a fight in our hands because the threats to freedom of expression that he identified in 2010 have only become more profound in the intervening uh, years. We are again in the teeth of a desperate global conflict between geopolitical power blocks, much like the Cold War, and much like the Cold War, our current situation is at risk of escalating into a global war. Uh, really, in which Sak Sakharov and Oppenheimer's weapons might actually even be finally unleashed. So working for peace is more important now than it ever was. But unlike the Cold War, as Julian said, the free alliance of liberals and conservatives have gone. We've lost our way. Uh, liberals are just as likely now to demand censorship of those who think differently. They're very good at uh, protecting the plight of foreign dissidents, but are quite happy to dismiss dissent at home as disinformation. So freedom of, uh, inform of uh, speech is under attack in Russia for sure, but it's also atta under attack here in the European Union. And defending that, no one exemplifies that more than Julian Assange. Like Sakharov, Julian Assange was also a physicist in a past life. He was a student at the School of Physics in Melbourne University. Like Safar Sakharov, he was a dissident in his own hemisphere. But unlike Sakharov, the invention that Assange gave to the world is not a weapon of war. It was a massive weapon of peace. WikiLeaks, his life's work, was meticulously engineered to defend the fundamental principles of journalism in holding power to account. He built WikiLeaks at a time when the traditional institutions of journalism were spectacularly failing to hold Western governments to account, to restrain the lies that had started in the war in Iraq. And as Assange famously said, if wars can be started by lies, then peace can be started by the truth. And WikiLeaks almost immediately put to the test, exposing the United States and its allies' role in Afghanistan and Iraq. He didn't flinch at that test. He upheld the central responsibility of a journalist. He published without fear or favour and aimed to hold those in power to account. And it is for that and nothing else that he is being persecuted at the moment, in plain sight by the United States government. What was unthinkable 12 years ago, when the Guardian, Der Spiegel, the New York Times, everybody was publishing WikiLeaks, the Aldi group were hosting him and fetting him here as a hero. And look at the situation now, 12 years on. As Stella said, this is not just a case about freedom of expression in the United States or in Europe. It's a global case. The effects of WikiLeaks work were not just felt in Europe or North America, but genuinely, absolutely everywhere. From Ireland to Haiti to Bulgaria, Ecuador, Brazil, Afghanistan, Tunisia, Egypt, every country that had a US embassy or a US base. So if the US can charge a journalist anywhere in the world with espionage, and use extradition law to grab them, that establishes universal jurisdiction. It is a direct assault on the ability of ordinary people, the whole world over, to organise together, to seek justice and to work and forge for peace and mutual respect and cooperation that is so desperately needed in our time. So we do have, as we leave here and as we assemble here, a grave responsibility to the world and to future generations, to give everything that we have for Assange's freedom. And in light of all that, it's totally right that he is a candidate for the Sakharov Prize. He's shown more than many of the beneficiaries of it, I'd have to be honest, but that's a separate matter, uh, exemplary adherence to the principle of freedom of thought. He's made an immense contribution to the defence of human rights and the cause of peace and his suffering, as has been so heartbreakingly outlined for that stance. No outcome would be better than giving him a prize. Uh, it could really uh, put things on centre stage and I really 
urge everybody to get behind it, but not just that, but all of the activities in the coming weeks to save Julian's life, to defend his legacy and actually to save freedom of thought and expression in the European Union and the world. Now, 2022 marks the 10th year that uh, Julian Assange has been deprived of his freedom. And his confinement is a constant reminder that even in Western societies, journalists and publishers are still risking their freedom and their lives for confronting power and telling the truth. Uh, Julian Assange founded WikiLeaks in 2006 to do just that, to uh, confront the powerful with the truth. And from then on, his leaks and publications drummed up support for a wave of change across the world. But it was a step too far for those in power, and the consequences are incisive. Today, for his efforts to expose injustices ranging from human rights infringements to espionage, mass surveillance to tax avoidance, Assange faces an uncertain future solely dependent on the final decision of courts. Should he be extradited, Julian would face a court in the United States, a country where his fundamental rights cannot be guaranteed. When Julian Assange began publishing these documents, he was aware of the risks he was taking. But he put the good of society and public knowledge of injustice above his own safety. And that's where he stands example. This is the courage we need to see so much more of. His case, however, also demonstrated that freedom of the press and the rule of law are generally under threat. Because of his fate, journalists sense what the prize of investigative research can be and can be deterred from uncovering abuses and corruption by the powerful. And this climate of fear is something we cannot tolerate if we want to preserve the rule of law and ensure freedom of the press in our democracy. In Julian Assange's own words, every time we witness an injustice and do not act, we train our character to be passive in its presence and thereby eventually lose all ability to, def to defend ourselves and those we love. Two years ago, I visited the United States on a European Parliament mission and representatives of the US Department of Justice openly told me that journalists would be prosecuted just like Assange. They didn't say it was just because he was dealing with the internet or he wasn't a journalist. They said, we will apply exactly the same principles to any journalist. And um, members of the press and bloggers deserve our special protection not to be prosecuted like criminals. The public has a right to know about state crimes committed by those in power to be able to stop them and bring them to justice. Let's also not forget Julian's family and the tireless work for his cause. I have been able to meet his father on previous occasions and I'm thrilled to meet his wife today, uh, who is, by the way, among my followers on Twitter, even though she doesn't know, <laughs> I've learned today, and who is trained in law just uh, like I am. And, and this is why I did decide to study law, because the purpose is to ensure that justice is done, that rules should protect the powerless from those in power. So, um, Stella, I really appreciate all the work that um, you are doing and, and have been doing. And also, politically, um, Julian Assange's case is a showcase for why it's so important that we in the European Parliament uh, fight for safeguards, fight for protection of fundamental rights. We fight every day for limitations to government powers. And... Um, uh, you know, people keep telling us what, what could go wrong. But here you can see what can go wrong. And that's why it's so important. I remember the terrorist content online regulation and we kept fighting for protecting uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, or on the Digital Services Act. We said, what about these cross-border uh, uh, removal orders if one country can decide to have content removed anywhere? Um, so that's why it's important. That's why it matters. And also... This is a showcase for why we are right in the European Union to be so skeptical concerning the cooperation with the United States. Because they do all the practices that, that you outlined, Stella, um, the human rights abuses. 
um, their court system um, does not allow for, for challenging these actions. The case of El Masria that you mentioned, he tried to challenge the US in court and it was struck down for reasons of national security. You cannot challenge uh, national security actions in US courts, which is a blatant uh, violation of fundamental rights. So I'm a member of the um, Pirate Party and actually a co-founding member of the German uh, Pirates. And our party is all about transparency and government accountability and fundamental rights. So parties have been set up to defend that. And we have long made it clear that uh, publishers are protected by the freedom of the press and must not be prosecuted for exposing abuses of states or those in power. Julian Assange's immense sacrifice to reveal the truth has changed the world we live in for the better. Uh, bringing in an era where injustice can no longer simply be swept under the carpet. And the devastating consequences of war have been put on display for all of society to see. For that, we owe him a deep debt of gratitude. The Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought is the highest tribute paid by the European Union to human rights work. And I'm proud to be among those members of the European Parliament who have nominated him for his prize. Just like we pirates have nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize earlier this year, I hope that this nomination will help his cause. And um, if he is not exemplary for human rights work and defending our rights, who is? Thank you very much. Uh, my dear colleagues, thank you everybody for participating. It is an honor for me today to be here with you, especially with uh, Ms. Stella Assange. I have been following the case of Julian Assange long before I was involved in politics. I felt that it is extremely important. It is extremely important because it will decide, it does decide on the direction the world will be heading. Uh, will it be run by the free people? with their rights and freedoms, or will it be run by co uh, corrupt governments and extremely powerful corporations? This uh, case is also extremely important uh, in whistleblower protection, in German journalism. Uh, this is a case of freedom of press, of human rights preservation, of freedom of thought and, of course, expression itself. It is extremely important and historic what WikiLeaks does. It is indeed, as you said, a political case, and the system does want to make an example of Julian Assange. This is why they are violating his rights, his human rights and uh, his rights as a citizen, and why they are torturing him in the prison. I wish to thank you for your strength, for your uh, persistence, and for your courage, uh, also to your children and the entire family and all the activists. And have no fears, Julian Assange has global support. I also wish uh, that his health will improve soon and that uh, we can visit him in prison in the United Kingdom. And of course, I wish to thank all my colleagues who supported this initiative, to reward Sakharov Prize to Julian Assange. He indeed uh, deserves it, and he is by far the closest to its original value and idea. Thank you very much. Grazie a tutti. Come è stato detto, le accuse che sono state mosse ad Assange, Assange è stato accusato di spionaggio, un'accusa che non è mai stata mossa negli Stati Uniti e nessun altro giornalista. E... Ed è un messaggio questa accusa, è evidentemente un messaggio, un messaggio ai giornalisti, agli attivisti, ai whistleblower. Perché? State zitti. State zitti perché se andate contro il potere, il potere vi può rovinare la vita. E questo lo dice sostanzialmente uno Stato che si dice democratico, uno Stato che è paladino della democrazia, uno Stato che esporta la democrazia. Io mi domando anche a livello legale quali sono le basi per poter perseguire Assange negli Stati Uniti, 
perché in teoria ci dovrebbe essere un, un diritto che è anche quello della territorialità di dove vengono commessi i reati, per cui io domando anche se c'è un fondamento su questo. Peraltro è stato detto che eh, c'è anche un processo in Spagna per questo che eh, Assange è stato spiato, è stato spiato quando era nell'ambasciata dell'Ecuador eh, ed è stato eh, spiato illegalmente chiaramente perché non, non è previsto dalla legge che un, un cittadino possa essere spiato mentre parla con la sua famiglia, mentre parla col suo avvocato soprattutto e quindi chi lo accusa sostanzialmente sapeva già in anticipo quali erano le contromosse della difesa e questo va al di fuori di qualsiasi diritto internazionale allora eh, in questo Parlamento nelle istituzioni europee noi parliamo sempre di stato di diritto di libertà di stampa di diritti umani ma dove sono finiti per Assange? possibile che non ci rendiamo conto di quanto è grave questa situazione non possiamo essere così servi di uno Stato da eh, non difendere quelli che sono i diritti fondamentali di queste istituzioni. Poi io ritengo che questo sia anche un periodo molto particolare, è un periodo di guerra, è un periodo in cui si parla di propaganda, di fake news, e, e, però è un periodo in cui la propaganda e le fake news possono venire da diverse parti. Cioè, quello che ha messo davanti a tutto Assange è stata la verità. In questo momento è la verità che noi dobbiamo difendere. Da qualsiasi parte venga. Ed è un momento molto importante per difendere la, la verità, perché la verità è anche collegata alla nostra democrazia, alla tenuta della nostra democrazia. E Assange poteva vendere le cose che aveva ricevuto. L'hanno fatto in tanti. Eh, ci sono stati casi anche recenti di persone che sono di hacker che sono riusciti ad entrare in, uh, uh, in database, sono riusciti ad ottenere del, delle informazioni riservate che poi sono state rivendute agli stessi stati. Gli stati hanno pagato, queste persone non sono state accusate, non sono in carcere. E poi pensiamo alla situazione in generale. Assange ha fatto scoprire crimini di guerra, Assange è in carcere, chi ha commesso i crimini di guerra è libero, le vittime, qualcuno si ricorda delle vittime? Nel, nel filmato Collateral Murder, il primo che è quello che ha fatto più scalpore diciamo, e c'è un padre che ferma la macchina per andare a soccorrere delle persone che sono state ferite tra cui anche due eh, giornalisti della, della Reuters e la versione ufficiale è che quello fosse un atto di guerra il padre viene ucciso, i due bambini vengono feriti e eh, se fossimo rimasti alla versione ufficiale quel padre era assimilabile a un terrorista questi bambini sarebbero cresciuti con l'onta di avere un padre terrorista. Invece Assange ha ridato dignità a questa persona, era semplicemente un uomo che si è fermato per prestare aiuto. Quindi noi abbiamo un grosso dovere nei confronti di Assange, lo ripeto, abbiamo un grosso dovere nei confronti della nostra libertà di stampa, della nostra democrazia e del nostro diritto di sapere la verità. Difendiamo il nostro diritto di sapere la verità. E un'altra un piccola cosa, in Italia è stata approvata una legge sulla giustizia che limita fortemente il diritto di cronaca. Proprio oggi c'è la mobilitazione dei giornalisti italiani per, che, per contrastare questa, questa legge. È mia intenzione di cercare di portare questa protesta anche alle istituzioni europee e oggi, in un momento in cui si parla di libertà di stampa, Volevo esprimere tutta la mia solidarietà ai giornalisti italiani, io sono giornalista prima di essere europarlamentare e quindi tutta la mia solidarietà ai giornalisti che si occupano di cronaca e che adesso fanno veramente fatica a scrivere le notizie. E ora la parola la lascerei a voi, se avete delle domande, se avete degli interventi, abbiamo l'occasione di avere qua Stella, quindi insomma se ogni dubbio <ride> lei è qui. Grazie.
difficult question maybe. How high do you judge the chances that Julian Assange gets the prize? I think you should better. È molto molto difficile. È veramente molto difficile che lui possa riuscire ad ottenere il premio Sakharov perché quest'anno abbiamo i gruppi parlamentari più grossi, hanno candidato eh, SND Renew, hanno candidato il popolo ucraino. Eh, L'IPP ha candidato Zelensky in nome del popolo ucraino e ICR ha candidato Zelensky. E quindi... Eh, probabilmente non, non, non sappiamo se unificheranno la candidatura ma ci sono delle divisioni quindi probabilmente no adesso vediamo e noi vorremmo almeno far arrivare Assange nella terzina finale negli ultimi tre finalisti questo sarebbe per noi già un passo avanti molto importante perché è comunque un segno politico e... però è un anno particolare questo I've read that uh, Listrus is going to give uh, the British government powers to override human rights court. I wanted to know uh, how do you uh, assess the impact of this uh, strategy on uh, the Julian Assange case? Uh, well, this is actually a, a threat that has been ongoing through consecutive governments in the United Kingdom <clears throat> to withdraw from, from, or at least water down um, enormously, the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction over the UK. Um, especially after the um, Rwanda po policy earlier this year, um, they're specifically... Um, trying to end uh, the European Court's ability to um, impose interim measures, stop that kind of thing immediately. Um, look, I, <laughs> we're, I'm obviously very concerned uh, about the impact of that if it goes ahead. Uh, the, unfortunately, it's quite a uh, driving electoral argument for the Conservatives. Uh, the European Court is seen as a, you know, a, in, in, the, in the mindset of, the, um, of many voters in the UK, it's similar to, to the European Union, something imposed from a, abroad. Uh, um, so... It may well be that by the time Julian has an opportunity to appeal a final decision from the domestic courts in the UK to the European Court of Human Rights, that that will not have the um, necessary force to be able to stop it. Which is why we have to stop talking about this case as a legal process. It's a, it's, a, it's a power grab through the legal process in order to drive a political persecution. And I resist um, questions about, you know, of course I can talk about the process. Yeah, we're appealing to the human rights, I mean to the, to, to the high court in, in the UK at the moment. But that supposes that the... The process itself is what is uh, where the center of gravity lies, and that's absolutely false. It, call, it, it creates a false impression. And if I start talking about the process, I almost buy into it, and I don't buy into it, I completely reject it. Okay, uh, good morning. I want to. Um, to give all our support on, on behalf of our group, the Green CIFA group, I'm 
member uh, of the um, of the group. I'm from Galicia. I was on the 15 April 2019 in London to have a, a visit at nine o'clock with Julian Assange the day uh, he was in prison with two deputies from the Linke, Heike Hansel and, and the spokesperson of the Linke, and we were with Fidel Narvaez in the embassy the day he was uh, kidnapped, because that is a, a, a really a sequestro, how we say in Spanish. Uh, uh, we couldn't have this, this meeting because Julian was in prison. So we were to the benchmark to give a, a press conference in, in front of the prison. Uh, I need uh, Stella, uh, you can find here all our support of uh, Miguel Urban, of uh, Sandra, of Tatiana, of Pier Paola, Pier Nicola. We are persons of different political groups. You can have all our support, uh, also for your children. But uh, I think we need to go again, as Claire, Claire proposed, to the prison. I think we need to do political pressure. If he has not the Sakharov Prize, don't problem. It's not a problem. We need to have the, because you say, uh, save his life. And we are in all the case in the world as we and our forces are allowed with the refugees, with the Kurdish, with the Palestinians, with the Sahrawis, but with Julian, because Julian gives us the truth and we need to support him in all the case and in every moment. So, Estela, uh, do you think it's possible to have a visit in the prison of some delegation of the MEPS? And thank you very much for your strong work. Thanks. Um, well, during the period that uh, the prison was closed for COVID, uh, which was very long, um, I mean, I couldn't visit him for something like seven months. Uh, he didn't see his lawyers for, I think it was six months. For that entire period, also, he didn't see his lawyers. And in fact, the first time he saw his lawyers after that six-month period was inside the courtroom for the three-week um, extradition hearing. Imagine how, how do you prepare a case like that, huh? Um, and I know that they were, for a while, just allowing uh, family members to visit. But I think now's the time uh, to try. I think it's possible, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Sandra Pereira. I'm from Portugal and I'm also a member of the European Parliament. I'm, uh, and uh, uh, I agree with a lot of things that were said before, so I won't repeat them. I just want to, to tell you that we are uh, to show our solidarity with, uh, with you and uh, with Assange. And uh, also, we also support the candidacy for the Sakharov Prize. And some um, uh, months ago, we wrote a letter to the British and the American authorities asking to, to refuse, to the British authorities to refuse the, the extradition of Assange to the United States. To the, uh, the United States of America, we ask to dismiss the charge against Julian Assange. And of course, we also ask for the immediate release of Julian Assange. And I think these uh, demands are still actual and we are fighting for them also here in the European Parliament, but also in Portugal. And we want to say this to you. Thank you so much. Ok, I'm going to speak in Italian too. Uh, allora, io uh, sono Pier Nicola Pedicini, sono un parlamentare europeo anch'io. E mi unisco alle parole che, di solidarietà che sono state espresse da dei colleghi, in particolare da Anna Miranda, con la quale condividiamo il gruppo EFA. Uh, prima di, di, fare una mia, di dare un mio supporto personale a a Stella Morris e tutta la famiglia di Assange, volevo dire che eh, volevo esprimere una mia preoccupazione forte, perché io sto vedendo al Parlamento europeo una deriva che mi ha sorpreso tantissimo. 
il Parlamento europeo è come se fosse in preda a una specie di allucinazione in questo, in questo periodo. Io vedo la, le persone che sono i parlamentari, purtroppo non le persone, perché loro esprimono, dovrebbero rappresentare il volere delle persone, ma temo che non lo facciano. Vedo una specie di allucinazione tutta concentrata, tutta indirizzata sul pensiero unico, senza la possibilità di, di avere il vero, il vero, una vera chance di, di ragionamento autonomo, la, una vera possibilità di pensiero libero. Eh, io vedo che in questo momento il mondo si sta dividendo, stiamo vivendo un momento davvero critico, penso che lo percepiscano tutti, ma il mondo si sta dividendo in due, piuttosto che eh, est verso ovest, come ci vogliono far pensare, si sta dividendo sempre di più tra una sfera che sta in alto e una sfera che sta in basso. E la sfera che sta in alto comprende un po' eh, la grande finanza, se volete, l'industria delle armi, l'industria dell'energia, tutto quello che volete. Dall'altra parte ci sono persone che vogliono una vita semplice, che vogliono una vita normale e che non hanno la possibilità di essere informati su quello che sta succedendo. In mezzo ci dovrebbe essere, ci dovrebbe essere chi informa queste persone per far capire che in realtà sono loro che stanno patendo questa, questa situazione e invece non sono informate, il trucco è quello, eh. perciò ehm, io credo che Sabrina stia facendo un ottimo lavoro nel, nel portare qui ancora una volta questo, questo tema che ha un valore simbolico enorme, il tema di Assange è il tema che, che dovrebbe far capire alle persone che stanno di sotto che senza informazione, senza pe pe pensiero libero, non avranno mai la possibilità di ribellarsi a un modello che, che li sfrutta fino in fondo e che eh, li fa vivere inermi e impassibili a, a una guerra che, che non vogliono. Io vedo che in questo momento la, le persone, direi tutto il mondo, le persone normali non vogliono questa guerra e vogliono che qualcuno si, si, si batta affinché questa guerra smetta Eppure vedo che nel Parlamento europeo non c'è quasi nessuno, se non qualche presente, che esprime invece e rappresenta il vero pensiero delle persone. Sono tutti indirizzati verso il pensiero unico che tende a supportare chi questa guerra la vuole. Quindi, ripeto, per me il valore simbolico di un premio Sakharov ad Assange sarebbe importantissimo, però è proprio per questo che non lo avrà mai. Perché al Parlamento europeo abbiamo potuto vedere, io l'ho visto dal mio gruppo, noi abbiamo sostenuto la, la candidatura nel mio gruppo, ma il mio gruppo si è schierato contro, eppure sono, sono solitamente eh, molto, molto illuminati rispetto a questi temi. Nessuno ha il coraggio davvero di prendere una posizione forte e determinata, perché significherebbe prendere una posizione forte e determinata contro gli Stati Uniti. E questo non se lo possono permettere, questo ci fa capire davvero quanto è grave la situazione, perché il Parlamento è europeo e quindi le istituzioni europee non hanno la possibilità di prendere una posizione forte contro gli Stati Uniti in questo momento. La cosa è grave è quella e la cosa, è grave è che, la cosa più grave è che i cittadini non lo sanno e che i cittadini non lo sapranno mai. Quindi credo che da parte nostra, oltre alla solidarietà personale che esprimo, a Stella Morris, a, a tutta la famiglia, ai figli, ai genitori di Assange. Da parte nostra eh, quello che possiamo fare è appunto fare le cose che sta facendo oggi Sabrina, cercare di, di compensare quella informazione che non c'è con tutte le armi possibili, perciò ti ringrazio Sabrina e vi ringrazio voi per quello che state facendo. Io mi chiamo Dino Gianrusso, sono anche io un deputato del Parlamento eh, europeo. Eh, ho condiviso e ho appoggiato l'ipotesi di Sabrina, la, 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 la proposta della candidatura di Giuliano Assange, anzi a dire la verità avevo avuto l'idea di candidarlo, ho saputo che Sabrina stava raccogliendo le firme e ho appoggiato la sua proposta per la quale la ringrazio perché è stata un'idea giusta, condivisibile e anche coraggiosa. Eh, sembra strano che sia stato coraggioso perché il Parlamento europeo ehm, in linea teorica dovrebbe essere eh, unito e eh, compatto nel sostenere questa candidatura ma come abbiamo visto, come ha detto Sabrina, non sarà facile, anzi sarà molto difficile che questo premio venga assegnato a Giuliana Assange nel salutare, nel ringraziare per la sua presenza Stella Morris, la, la moglie di Giulian ehm, voglio parlare 
per pochi, per pochi minuti, per pochi secondi di quello che avviene anche nei singoli paesi europei, in particolare nell'Italia. Io prima di essere deputato sono stato un giornalista d'inchiesta, facevo il giornalista d'inchiesta e ehm, sembra strano ma vedo l'Italia in questa mappa che c'è disegnata lì sopra che ha più o meno lo stesso colore di diversi paesi africani, è un paese molto indietro eh, nella classifica della libertà di stampa e non è un caso. Vedete Julian Assange viene ricordato giustamente per il suo coraggio ma dovrebbe essere anche ricordato per la sua abilità, per la sua capacità di reperire informazioni riservate e poi di diffonderle ma prima di reperirle non è facile per chi fa questo mestiere trovare le notizie e lui è riuscito a farlo e poi ha avuto il coraggio di raccontare al mondo determinate cose scomode oggi nel nostro paese in Italia eh, vengo a portare Stella anche da parte dei miei territori la Sicilia e la Sardegna i territori che mi hanno eletto in Parlamento europeo una grande solidarietà una grande ammirazione per Giuliano Assange ma allo stesso tempo ci sono tanti in Italia soprattutto fra i giornalisti che ne parlano male che ne parlano male sui social che fanno dell'ironia che parlano di Giuliano Assange come mi spiace dirlo ma quasi alla stregua di un terrorista, di un personaggio pericoloso, di un personaggio destabilizzante per l'ordine mondiale. Ecco, io credo che la battaglia che va fatta, oltre a questa sacrosanta del premio, oltre a queste iniziative e altre che faremo, noi abbiamo incontrato anche il papà di Giuliano Assange qui eh, in Parlamento, è stato molto piacevole conoscerlo e io ero stupito dalla sua capacità di sorridere, di essere sempre positivo, nonostante quello che, passa, che sta passando suo figlio. Io credo che il nostro dovere sia quello di fare una battaglia culturale, e questo non si esaurisce eh, nei singoli giorni, nelle singole iniziative, perché vivo in un paese, e ho lavorato in questo settore, in un paese dove cose infinitamente meno importanti e meno rilevanti di quelle che ha trovato Julian e che ha diffuso Julian, hanno creato problemi a molti di noi. E il primo problema, sapete qual è? È quello della minaccia implicita non lavori più, della di un sistema che cerca di isolare non chi trova chissà quali prove di chissà quali complotti ma semplicemente magari dice la verità su qualcuno che è un potente e che in Italia si preferisce non toccare su, in tutti i settori e in tutti i campi oggi io credo che queste iniziative siano estremamente positive ringrazio ancora Sabrina per quello che ha fatto per questa giornata ma credo che Dobbiamo combattere una battaglia culturale lunga e difficile perché sennò si normalizzerà la sterilizzazione dell'informazione. Grazie. Uh, hi, my name is Telios Kuloglu. I'm also a member of the European Parliament. Uh, well, uh, i think that uh, Julian deserves uh, the Sakharov Prize for 1,000 reasons. We all know that. It's not a matter to explain it. The problem is that this parliament is not going to give never the, the Sakharov Prize to Julian Assange. Because the Sakharov Prize has been kidnapped by the majority of the parliament to do cheap short-minded political stuff to play diplomatic and other political games with different countries. And it's, it's not, it's not a, 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 an award given to the best people of the planet. Sometimes it happens, but sometimes it does not happen. And we don't uh, have to, ex to expect any kind of award, especially for Julian, because he's against the United States and the United States have, have, uh, have very powerful allies within the European Parliament. So unless there is a kind of revolution, uh, we have to, to decide what else to do. For instance, in the, in the group of the left uh, uh, in the, during the previous mandate, because of the distortion of the Zaharov Prize, we have established a, a prize in the name, after the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galicia, in the name of Daphne Caruana Galicia, with the participation of the family in the jury, and we, we launched 
uh, an alternative uh, uh, award for uh, whistleblowers and for the freedom of information. Actually, when we, we launched in 2018 the whole idea of the award, Julia spoke via teleconference here in this, in this uh, same hall. We spoke with him, you know. The, actually, the, the initiative was uh, with Miguel, me, and uh, some other um, uh, Marisa uh, of the parliament. So we spoke with him. And next year, 2019, Julian Assas has been awarded the, the award for the freedom of information in, 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 the, in this uh, place, together with the participation of the family of, uh, of uh, um, Daphne Caruana and with an independent jury uh, to decide. So what I'm saying is, and what I, will, I would like to tell you is that uh, what we have to do is not waiting for the majority to become, uh, you know, uh, good people, you know, it's not going to happen, you know. They're not going to change. They're, they're, they're guys, you know, you know, I mean, uh, half of them are political exiles as, uh, from their parties and the other half are waiting to become a minister or prime minister, you know. They will never uh, broke a kind of uh, deal with the United States. That's the problem. So what we have to do uh, um, and uh, is that uh, members from different political group and, uh, groups, and this is uh, quite a, uh, an opportunity today, is to unite forces uh, just to, you know, to insist and to, uh, again, to repeat and repeat uh, the case of Julian Assange because it's uh, fundamental for the democracy and for the future of journalism. And this is what we have to do. And we have to, to make... Uh, the public appears, and we have to go uh, collectively, or to us to go to the prison, and uh, we have to do different stuff to make to make the most possible uh, uh, actions and noise and public relations in order to influence uh, the, the 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 outcome of the case. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Let me introduce myself, Nicholas Fest, ID Group. Dear Mr. Assange, this was a very gripping statement that you gave, but I would like to know from you, what can we do? I mean, I think you heard that um, the Zakharov Prize will probably not go to your husband. And so, but what else could we do? You know, is there a fund that we can support or is there, uh, are there any other ideas you've got to how we can speed up the release of Julian Assange? Shall we, shall we uh, put up a clock indicating how many days he is now imprisoned without you know, a final verdict? Or what can we do from your point of view? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I, I find it a very fascinating discussion to be sitting here and, and hearing your perspectives on this. Frankly, I've, um, over the, you know, this year, I've been a bit horrified by the failure of leadership by the EU generally to deal with the international situation, to look out for its own interests. It's an extremely dangerous situation. And as, as some of you were pointing out, I think this is partly due to a general deterioration of the quality of, quality of information um, that we receive as a public. And because the quality of information informs the quality of the discussion and um, the ability to chart out uh, a way out um, solutions constructively. Uh, and instead, we're, we're I think, um, going blind into an extremely even more unstable and dangerous uh, situation for Europe. You know, uh, anyway, um, in terms of Julian, I, I didn't come here with the expectation of Julian winning the prize. I don't need to be, you know, I don't think anyone in this room needs to be convinced about Julian's um, deserving the prize. He is, uh, Julian embodies in, in the strongest terms, democracy at its strongest 
and uh, his continued imprisonment. I often, you know, talk about what WikiLeaks revealed and and the publications that he's prosecuted over the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, but his persecution and his prosecution are actually of ongoing um, relevance in the sense that they are uh, corrupting the institutions that are furthering them. Uh, they are, uh, by keeping him imprisoned, you have to uh, continuously erode the safeguards uh, that are supposed to kick in to set him free. So what we're, what we're witnessing, all of us, is a progressive deterioration of our safeguards. And these safeguards are being eroded, of course, in the aftermath of the, of, of the um, uh, 11th of September attacks, when rights started being withdrawn on an exceptional, so-called exceptional basis. What happened? The so-called war on terror is, has come and gone, and where are we at now? We never got them back, and in fact, we're in a much worse position. So Julian's case is uh, defining, as I said, defining of our times, and it has to be cast in that sense, in that way. And um, I, I think uh, we need to also uh, draw on the where, where the political um, representatives fail. We need to also draw on the, um, let's say, moral and ethical leadership of civil society, because civil society, in terms of every big human rights organization that you can think of, and every big, uh, big um, press freedom group, is, they're all on Julian's side. They are completely unequivocal that Julian's case is politically motivated, that he has to be released, that the U.S. is, is, um, is going after uh, press freedoms when it's going after Julian. It's going to the, after the heart. It, the attack is at the heart of the freedom of the press. So, um, you know, if, if you, if you uh, can't... Um, I think... Yes, draw on the, on the um, alliance of those groups, of the International Federation of Journalists, of Amnesty International, of the Reporters Without Borders. They're all on side, and they all understand the implications. I think also the uh, implications for the EU. What does this mean? What does this case mean? You know, there was... Uh, I haven't spoken perhaps about the most important aspect um, that we've learned since Julian's arrest, which is that Julian was um, being targeted for assassination by the, by the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, under Mike Pompeo. That the U.S. intelligence agencies were planning to assassinate Julian on European soil. And they were also canvassing the possibility of extraordinary rendition against Julian and taking him to black sites of repurposing those that um, uh, complete undermining contempt for the international order that was introduced after 9-11, right? Having torture camps, creating little uh, areas of well, black sites, areas of exception where you could torture, where you could just kidnap people, put them indefinitely for years without trial in Guantanamo Bay. Well, that's the way the CIA operates. And what did they do? They repurposed that under Pompeo, and they thought, well, we should do that against Assange and WikiLeaks. And okay, they didn't take him to a black site, but they took him to Balmarsh, and they've put him there indefinitely and he faces 175 years in prison. How much of a, uh, of a qual qualitative leap are we talking about there? Not much. 
So I'm not I'm not sitting in your chair. I'm not a member of the European Parliament. I'm not I don't know the the full range of possibilities, but I know that this is exactly where Julian's case should be alive and discussed constantly. Uh, the, the nomination is in itself protective. I'm not saying it's enough, but it's hugely significant that I'm able to then go uh, to the British parliamentarian or the um, British mainstream journalist and say, actually, Julian's nominated for the Sakharov Prize. They say, really? Huh. That's, that gives me uh, the ability to fight harder. These kinds of signs of, of uh, showings of, of political support, they help me, and they help Julian. Uh, so just keep them coming, please. And um, there are... Uh, um, you can you can obviously um, help Julian fight the 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 legal fight. It's very expensive, um, and join the um, the support groups and also the organised campaigns in the UK. It's don't extradite Assange. It also has an uh, international aspect to it, um, and the US um, also has a, a defenseassange.com. Uh, um, Follow me on, on Twitter. It's Stella Morris with one R, uh, number one. Or just search for Stella Assange. There's some trolls there, but I'm the one with 100,000 followers. Um, and just keep this case alive until he's free. We need to come together until he's free. And, uh, and we have to avoid the trap of treating this like it's a legal process. The legal process is just uh, for show. And it can stop any time. And I think it's wrong to think uh, that there's some kind of, that, that the US is a monolith on this. The case is extremely controversial in the United States. When Julian was charged under the Espionage Act, two prosecutors that were working on the case were, got taken off the case because they refused, they they disagreed with it. The Obama administration decided not to prosecute Julian in relation to the Manning leaks. Why? The DOJ spokesperson, Matthew Miller, he said, the Obama administration is not prepared to prosecute Assange because there is no way of distinguishing him from the rest of the press. And in order to prosecute Assange, you would have to set a precedent that could then be used against the rest of the press, and this administration is not prepared to do that. And they also said, Julian Assange acted as a publisher, not a hacker. Those are public statements by the DOJ spokesperson. Nothing changed. What changed is that they decided the next, administrat the next administration decided to go there. And that is the new standard. It's not just a standard for the United States against WikiLeaks. It is a standard that the United States can take against anyone. But think about it, not just the United States. The United States has long been a kind of international standard bearer because they have the First Amendment, which is much stronger than the European protections for, for freedom of speech and, and press freedom. But now they've taken the most aggressive, most dangerous global attack on press freedom globally. And so they've ad abandoned that leadership. And there is no one to stand up for it right now, not the European Union. Just you who have, who have nominated Julian, perhaps that's about it. Because there is no gold standard anymore. And you have Azerbaijan and you have China and so on. They love bringing up Julian's case to talk about the hypocrisy of the West. But that argument, this hypocrisy, the whataboutism, it's a completely sterile argument. It's still born. It doesn't help anyone. It just... Uh, we lose, the citizens lose, the journalists lose. It, it's, it's, it's a sign of utter uh, nihilism. 
So we need to regain the we re need to regain the standard. And what really needs to happen is for the U.S. to receive signals from its allies, not its critics, not its enemies, from its allies to say this is unacceptable. This is encroaching on our jurisdiction. This affects journalists in Europe, freedom of speech in Europe. You've gone too far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tatiana Zdanok. I'm from Latvia, the country which has spent it uh, quite well, but, but we have political prisoners in our state, in neighboring. Uh, Lithuania and Estonia and elsewhere. And Stella, thanks for coming here and all my support. I just want to reflect, you told that so many human rights NGOs, so many, all of the organization defending freedom of press, etc., etc. When I saw the, the ending of the film, we was demonstrated here some weeks ago on, on Julian, on you, on John, and all this process. We, we see the author here. And the, there were titles of organizations who supported Julian, and my thought was with such a huge support for him, and he is in prison, yeah, and he is charged for, for so enormous quantity of years to be in prison. Uh, I think we, we, in any case, of course, it's clear, and I join, uh, reflect what Pierre Nicola Pedicini and three colleagues told, that majority of this house are just now thinking one truth, one idea, and nothing dissidentship. Not, not, no dissidentship is allowed, but, but still, we have to, to show our position and then and, and we have to go to this prison irresponsible of will they accept our visit or not, as we did in Basque country, as we did in Catalonia, as we did for other prisoners. We, we have to show our support and I'm ready myself and I hope Anna and we have to go there. I'm a long-standing member of this parliament, and I remember a visit of Julian ten years ago. But now I am non-attached because of my dissidentship within my political group. But still, we have mandate from our voters, from our people, and it, you have truth that here in the European Parliament and in so many member states, there are people who are supporting Julian, of course, and we we have to show this having our mandate together. Hello. I, uh, I'm just a film student here, so I'm no political or law expert, but I believe I've been seeing in the last few years in the world a more politically polarizing landscape. And I believe Unifying should be like a res better responsibility for all of us. So my question for you is, how would you argue Julian's case and the freedom of press case in such a way that could be the most politically unifying for the entire political spectrum? It depends who you're speaking to. <clears throat> um, I think there is an, perhaps for the, the general population that doesn't necessarily engage in the uh, might feel like the, the, the legal implications and and the more abstract ideas are a little bit difficult to engage with. I think the humanitarian argument is the strongest. The United States 
is um, has brought a case in which Julian risks 175 years in prison is grotesque. In the United Kingdom, Julian has been in prison in the harshest prison for seven and a half, uh, sorry three and a half years. He's not charged in the UK. He's not convicted in the US. But he's in a prison alongside the worst offenders indefinitely. And he has seen criminals who are convicted come and go during the period that he's been there. This shouldn't be happening for any fair-minded person. You know, Julian is, he did nothing different to what anyone else who published the WikiLeaks publications did. Like the editor of the te Telegraph, for example, the Guantanamo Bay files, which Julian faces out of the 175 years he faces, I think 40 years, that's a whole lifetime for the Guantanamo Bay files. The Daily Telegraph in the UK published exactly the same data, exactly the same data. There is no difference. They could bring a case against the Daily Tra Telegraph. They haven't, but they could. So what is the principle here? It is bringing a uh, selective prosecution against Julian as a warning to everyone else. Well, we could go after you too. We're choosing not to this time. But when you're talking to you know the regular people on the street, indefinite imprisonment in the harshest prison in the country. Um, because you publish the truth about war crimes. I don't know how it gets more compelling than that. But maybe uh, another way to get through to people is to make them watch collateral murder. I have not seen a single person who has seen collateral murder and has not got it like that. And Julian faces, by the way, 40 years in relation to the collateral murder publication. Stiamo, dovremmo chiudere la sala e quindi se, se avete altre domande vi chiedo se ci spostiamo fuori perché ci, ci cacciano diciamo, <ride> devono preparare un altro evento dopo e quindi... però eh, volevo estendere l'invito a tutti i parlamentari presenti eh, visto che eh, a prescindere dal, dal colore politico, a prescindere dal gruppo siamo uniti in questa causa, andiamo avanti, andiamo avanti assieme, andiamo avanti con le iniziative di tutti quanti e eh, cerchiamo insomma di, di portare avanti questa, questa battaglia tutti quanti insieme. Grazie.